Hello, I'm going to preach this morning um, from Romans 8, but I just want to pray before we start, um, and I, I just want to, I want to invite you guys to join me to pray, not really like out loud, like I'm not saying we all do it in symphony, but um, this stuff is serious, like this stuff, like the Word of God, like coming together and, and, and corporately hearing His Word and, and it either taking root in our lives or it not. Um, it's, it's super, super serious. It's like the biggest stuff ever. Um, it's, it's life for us. Um, and so I just wanted to encourage you to just pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for your neighbor. Um, just pray that we would really receive something from God, that God would say what he wants to say and, and not what this guy feels like he should say. Just, uh, I just want to pray, and I, I really pray that, that God can, can grab a hold of us and, and do something and change something and transform something in our lives um, as we just get in his word. Um, so let's just pray and just call on our God. God, we love you so much, and it's just so, um, I don't know the right word, glorious, when um, you're just around a bunch of people that are, that are inclining their hearts to you, Lord. It's so amazing, Father, and when you just fill the room, and, and things change, and, and, and you become big, and the world becomes small, Lord, and, and I just thank you. I thank you for what it's like to, to just call on you, and lean on you, and look to you, and just to receive from you, because you're faithful. God, I, I just pray that today you would have your way, Lord, that you would just speak your heart, your mind, Lord, use me um, to just say what you want to say, Father. I pray we gain, just, we'd see your truth in the word, Lord, and it would get inside of us and it would change us, Lord, and we would be committed to it, Father, and we would believe you, Father, and Lord, that you would just confirm your word just with your presence, Lord. We just love you so much, and we just really need you, God, so we're just calling on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you would open with me to, to Romans chapter 8.
We've been preaching through Romans, and it's amazing. Like, if you didn't get that already, it's awesome. Romans is so good. Um, I said, it's, it's been fun. Like, Pastor Rocky and I just, like, I mean, we've been doing it for how many weeks? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a lot since the summer. Yeah. So, uh, and it's just been really fun. We're like, oh, we're just, we're getting, let's do one more week on this because we want to talk about this. And we'll go another week on this because it's so good. And we want to, so uh, we're doing another week of Romans 8. And that's just how it goes. So uh, here we are. Um, and I just want to recap really quickly on something that I touched on last week. And I just had a burden that I wanted to just follow up on it. Um, and, and just, I don't know, just, just come again, present Help us to walk in it. I pray that we can, you know, get something from the Lord and, and, and take like a, a lot of times like things like sound good, but like they don't come out of us, right? They don't like take root in our lives. And so I just pray that we, we can, we can, God would help us to, to let that happen. <laughs> if that makes sense. That was good. Smooth. Um, so Romans chapter 8, I just want to recap. Last week I talked about this division that happens um, that, that Paul is bringing light to. He, he brings light to the inner man and the outer man. Um, so in chapter 7, he talks about his in, in his inmost being, he delights in the law of God. He loves the Lord. But in his outmost being, he can't even follow him. He can't even do the slightest thing that would ever please him. He's like, what's going on here? So he brings this, this separation between inner man and outer man. Last week, we really talked about what does it mean? What's the difference between inner man and outer man? We looked at the first 11 verses of Romans 8. They're all, it's all there. Um, I encourage you to get in it and, and look at it and study it and, 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 and you know, pray that God would show you um, but he basically, we, we have this inner, we have this outer man condition. We'll start there. But this outer man condition that we can't please God with our outer man. Like there's nothing I can do with my outer man that has eternal significance. Nothing. Even a good work. It doesn't have eternal significance. It's, it doesn't have the power of God. It, it doesn't have that. It doesn't, have, it doesn't bring life. The Bible actually says it brings death. And so that's why we can strive, 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 strive. I'm doing the best. I'm doing the most in this relationship, this relationship, this relationship. And all of them are breathing death. (laughs) Because that's all we can really muster up in in our outer man, our flesh. Our outer man, our flesh, is the part of us that is um, committed to the world. The worldliness, our flesh, our sinful nature. The part of us that is rooted in and committed to the world. And and it, it can't please God. right? We're in the world, but we're not of it. But then we have this inner man. When we get saved, born again, the Bible says that we were dead in our transgressions. He's talking about our our inner man. Obviously, we were alive. We've been doing stuff. Our inner man is born, brought to life by the power of God. Resurrected, brought to life, and put into a perfect relationship with the Lord Almighty. Because of what Jesus did, not because of us. Not because of our great faith, but because of what Jesus did. Our inner man is put into a perfect relationship where we receive, Romans 8, verse 1, no condemnation. So no condemnation for my inner man. I can approach God in, in the thickest of my sinful times because I'm right with him there. If I approach him in my outer man, I'm going to get condemned. I'm going to feel far from him. I'm going to feel like he's screaming at me and telling me he doesn't want me to be his child anymore. But if I approach him in my inner man, he's going to draw me in to a loving relationship. Our outer man is where sin dwells. So God will still condemn sin in your flesh. It's not okay. Like, you get saved, it's not okay that you continue um, having a bunch of sin in your flesh. But you're not condemned for it. The sin is condemned. God says, I love you, but I need to remove this from your life. This moment, like now. Like, as soon as possible. So it's just this outer man and inner man kind of thing going on. Um, the, The inner man can control our thoughts, our will, our emotions, or the outer man can control. And we all know different times when different mans are in control, right? We know it. It's clear to us. It's clear to us. We can feel it inside and we can see the fruit of it. What I want to do today is talk about how we can, simply just how can we live from the Spirit more? How can we live being controlled by our inner man, the one who's right with God, more than we live from the flesh, the the outer man, the sinful nature? And so we're just going to dive into that. um, And I hope to... Um, I have a lot of things on my mind, but I'm, ho- I'm praying that God will speak the right things. Because <laughs> I'm not really sure um, what to say all the time. But my first question, I have some questions up there. Can I know if I'm in the Spirit? Can I know if I'm in my Spirit right now? 
I'm not talking about like you look back on a memory and like, oh yeah, I probably wasn't in the spirit there because I did this, this, and this. I'm talking about right in this moment, every moment of our waking lives, can we know if we're in the spirit or if we're in our flesh? The answer I'd like to propose to you is yes. The answer I would like to propose to you is yes. And, and in short, let me read Romans 8 verse uh, 16. Because 12 through 17 where we're going to focus today, and I believe it brings some light to the verses before. Romans 8 verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness, witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So there's this inner witness in my inner man that I am in right relationship with God. But sometimes, don't you feel like you're not in right relationship with God? Don't you feel shame and condemnation? Let me propose to you that maybe you're not in your inner man. Maybe you're not in the spirit. Maybe you're in your flesh. So, so yeah, let's start there. So I believe that you can know that you're in the spirit. And we're going to talk about, I hope to dissect it a little bit, demystify. Because I feel like a lot of times we're just like, I don't know, it's random. Just like sometimes, you know, I feel God's presence and his joy and his peace. And sometimes I don't. I don't know. I just go with the flow. And, and I want to propose to you that's not really the way we ought to live. The, the Bible says that Jesus bought us access. He tore the veil of the Holy of Holies and bought us access to live a life in God's presence, in right relationship with him, out of the spirit, out of what he's put in us. And I think it's easy to sell that cheap based on our experience. Like, well, no, 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 I know we can't always know, or I know we can't because, you know, I have ebbs and flows all the time. Does that mean that's what God's word says, or does that mean that's your experience? You know? And so I want to just kind of throw it out there as kind of an invitation, like, hey, maybe there's more. Maybe we can live in the spirit more. Maybe we can actually know we're in the spirit so we don't go into that situation and act out of our flesh, but instead we, 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 we get armored up and we wait on the Lord to grab hold of us, and then we go into it and, and, and let God work through us, right? So I kind of just want to go into that. So my, my answer is this. Um, there's, a, there's a scripture in, in Revelation where John, um, literally, he, he has the vision of all the end time things, and he literally says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I began to have this vision. So he's like putting a finger on like, I was in the spirit then. I was spending time with God. I was connected with him in my inner man, right? And I was in the spirit, and then the Lord showed me all this awesome stuff. I had this vision. There's other uh, prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, where literally they're like, all of a sudden the Lord's hand came upon me and I was in the spirit. And it's like they, they knew they were in the spirit. They knew they were, per, per, they were in, um, what's my word? They were connected to God. They, they, they knew that they were aware of his presence, right? And so if I could kind of define in the spirit, I would define it as living, existing with an awareness of God's presence. That's it. That's literally it. If you're, oh yeah, I can't wait to do this example. But if you're in God's, if you're aware of God's presence, you're going to live differently. You're going to love differently. You're going to respond differently. You're going to let different things come out of you. You're going to keep other things not coming out of you. Serena, would you come up, please? Yay. So fun. I never tell her when I'm going to use her. I don't usually know. So let me just ask you guys, and you can answer out loud. Let me ask you a simple question. Am I close to Serena? Would you say I'm in her presence? Let me ask you a similar question. Am I close to Serena? Am I, would you say I'm in her presence? Right now, even though she's just as close to me, hello. She's just, you can sit down, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to start flirting in front of you all. I can't do that. Uh, that's my wife, by the way, if anybody doesn't know. Um, <laughs> just throwing it out there. Um, so what changed? She was just as close to me, but I wasn't aware of her. I wasn't looking through at the world with the mindset of she's near me. She wasn't in my vision. She wasn't in my sights. I wasn't facing her. I, 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 I wasn't looking at her. She was just as close, but I looked away. I looked somewhere else. And there was a clear, I felt a clear difference between when I was looking at her and when I wasn't. It was really good looking at her. And I looked away, I'm like, ah, oh, all, all these people. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> so like, maybe the problem isn't that you can't experience God at home. You only experience him at church. 
Maybe the problem is it's easier to look at him at church and we don't actually look at him at home. Maybe we read the Bible, but we're not looking at him. We're not aware of his presence. Maybe we pray, but we babble on like the Gentiles. That's what Jesus says not to do. Instead of getting connected with him in our inner man. Instead of getting connected with him and, and having communion with him. If your prayer, if your prayer life was 90% filled with, God, I just love you so much. But it was in God's presence. You, you actually got connected with him. You'd be far better off than praying the best prayers, having the best devotional you're praying through and all the right things to say and, and a prayer list with 50 people on it. You'd be far better off because you'd be doing things from your inner man and that's when God's power is attached to it. You'd be far better off. I'm not saying don't pray for people, but I'm saying we, 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 we got to, I'm, I'm, me too. Listen, I've been excited. I'm learning, I'm learning all this stuff. I'm just excited about it. Like, I want to know more. If I can either live with the filthiness of my flesh or the, the power, life, and peace, and love of Jesus Christ, I want to know the difference, and I want to know how to do one more than the other, right? So that's good. Um, so we can know if we're in the Spirit. How do we know? I want to just read from you a couple verses. Romans 8, verse 1. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, in the Spirit. So if you're feeling like you are in right relationship with God and you're just like aware of this goodness of your relationship with him and what he's done for you and how you don't deserve it, but man, here you are as his child, maybe you're in the spirit. There's a chance you're in the spirit. If you feel far from him, running from him, angry, thinking more about this situation than you are of his goodness, there's a chance you're in your flesh. Um, another thing, the, the Bible says in uh, somewhere in here, um, verse 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. If you're experiencing life and peace, there's a good chance you're in the spirit because the world can't offer those things. You might be in a terrible situation, but for some reason I just had life and peace. You're probably in the spirit. You're connected with God. <sighs> Spend time with him. <laughs> Talk to him. Enjoy it. Enjoy it because everything we do can have a form of godliness, as 1 Timothy says, but lack power. We can do anything that has a form of godliness, but the only things that have power are the things we do out of our spirit, out of our inner man, out of a, out of a right relationship with God. And I, and I pray, you know, one thing I, I pray that this, there's no condemnation for us. So, like, don't take this like, man, oh, I spend, I, I don't even know what that's like. I spend all, listen, it's an invitation. God's, God's inviting us in by the blood of Jesus that we can live in a constant awareness of him. That's an invitation. Listen, I, if I, was, I said this last service, I want to say, if I was up here preaching my experience, you all would go home. You don't want my experience. You want Jesus. I'm not saying I experienced this perfectly. I'm not saying you experienced this perfectly. But there's an invitation. Paul says, one thing I do, I forget what lies behind. I press on towards the goal, the upward call of Christ. This is the upward call of Christ, that we could actually have what he paid for. And not just like in waves or like in seasons, but all the time, living Connected to him. Jude says, pray at all times in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. In the Spirit. Not out of the Spirit. Not in the flesh. Pray in the Spirit, keeping yourself in the love of God. I want to be in the love of God, right? I better be in the Spirit. I better be in the Spirit. Um, and I hope to demystify this more, too, if you're like, what the heck is in the Spirit? I'm sorry. Um, second thing is, the Bible says this. Um, he will keep in perfect peace those whose minds stay fixed on him. That's like not something we should go about watering down. Even if my life hasn't been peaceful and I love Jesus, that doesn't mean I get to set a new standard that's like, well, most of the time you get to have peace if you love God. No, no, no. He will keep in perfect peace those whose what minds stay fixed on God. And what I believe he's probably saying is inner man, right? My, my inner man stays fixed on him. That's like a promise. It's literally a promise. The Bible says, do not worry about anything, but cast your anxieties, pray to him with all prayers and petitions, and then the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your heart and mind. That's like another promise. Literally. It puts some onus on us, but it's a promise. So I just want to, I said literally kind of funny there. You're laughing at me, Lindsay. It's fine. Um, but it's literally a promise in God's word. And so my, my goal is to just present like what Christ paid for, and then we can just freely, because we're saved, because we have grace, we can run after that thing. You know? We, we have grace for when we mess up, when we, if we haven't done it enough, if we haven't done it in the last year, if we haven't done it since the day we were saved. 
There's grace for that. He, he's, ready to, he's ready to change that. He's ready to transform that. So how do we know if we're in the spirit? I, I kind of already touched on that. Um, I want to read for you. Uh, chapter 8, verse 12 through 15. So after he talks all about the inner man and the outer man, he says, so then, brothers. And so what he's saying is like, this is the conclusion of that thought. We are in debt. We are debtors. But not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. You're not in debt to use your flesh and try to work as best as you can to earn your salvation. It's not what you're in debt to. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Of God. So he's saying the way we put to death the deeds of the body is not try better in our body. It's by the Spirit. Get in the Spirit. Worship God. We talked about it last week. Maybe you don't have to fix all these problems you have going on in your life. Maybe you just need to set them aside and worship Jesus. Like maybe you just need to get in his presence. Like, and I, I, this is like, how many times do we carve out a whole day to toil and try to fix all the things that are on fire in our life? And then you wake up the next day and they're still on fire. What if we carved out a whole day and fasted and, and worshiped God? What if we tried it that way? <laughs> you know, like what if we just tried it that way? I, I, I submit to you, it, things would probably go much better. The Bible, when, when Moses wanted to leave uh, Egypt, Pharaoh called them to go out in the wilderness and worship God. They didn't go out there to build him a temple. They went out there to worship him. Pharaoh said, you are idle. You just don't want to work. You're just idle. You're idle. You're idle. The world will call you idle. If you put off your responsibilities to worship Jesus. But Jesus says it's the way. Right? Jesus says it's the way. Obviously, there's a time and place when we need, to, we need to live in this world. But if you do it from this world, if you do it from your flesh, death, destruction, no peace. If you do it from the spirit, things might go a lot better. <laughs> things might go a lot better. I said this too. Oh, my gosh. Television. So easy to say we have no time for Jesus, but we watch two and a half hours of television a day. It's on while we go to sleep. It's what we're focusing on. It's what we're fixing on. We're on social media for three hours. We listen to secular music on our way home. And it's like all these times we could be in the presence of God, receiving good things, being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. And we're, you know, watching TV. Maybe we put the TV on as we read our Bible and we don't really get anything out of it because we're distracted and we're not in the spirit. I'm just throwing it out there. I have my own convictions, and they're, they're, I'm not good at following them, right? Like, I'm not, I, I can't tell you what your convictions are. But there's definitely time. There's definitely uh, so much time and place in our lives to value the presence of God, to value the presence of God. When we're all, like, worshiping in here, um, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. He literally inhabits, lives in the praises of his people. So when we're in here worshiping, like, it's not a coincidence that God's presence is strong when we're here worshiping. Like, we're like, wow, I just feel like God's love right now. I feel his joy. I feel his peace. I stopped worrying about all the things that were going on before. It's because he literally inhabits the praises of his people. And so I want to encourage you that you can praise God at home. <laughs> you can praise God at home, and, and you'll, you'll experience his presence at home. You'll experience his peace at home. You'll experience his life at home. Um, let's go on. What keeps me out of God's presence? Let's read verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So he makes this contrast between the Holy Spirit and the spirit of fear. And the Holy Spirit tells us we're God's children. Whom then shall I fear, right? Cries out, Abba, Father, son, adoption. God actually didn't just, he didn't just like naturally have me. I know this is a stupid analogy, but he adopted me. He chose. He saw me and said, you I'm grafting into my family. Right? Like that's the spirit that God gives us. That's one that can stay in perfect peace. But he contrasts it with the spirit of fear. And fear is a big one that the Bible warns against. I think more than anything else, um, because you literally, if you, once you start fearing, once worry and anxiety come in, this is, I'm here. Like, you, you just completely get your eyes off Jesus. You just completely do. You just completely do. But when you get your eyes on Jesus, worry and fear and anxiety have to, have to be gone. Right? So, like, that's the amazing thing. Like, 
What keeps us out of God's presence? Fear. But what keeps fear out of our lives? God's presence. Whew. Amen. Maybe I don't have to try harder to fear less. Maybe I just need to pursue God's presence more. Maybe I need to spend more time in his presence. Maybe I need to spend more time in worship. Maybe I, not to be, maybe I don't need to be worried so much about how's the right way to pray and what's the right way to do this. And maybe I literally just need to sit here and say Jesus' name until his peace comes over me. And then maybe once I have that peace over me, then maybe I'll start my Bible study. I encourage you, don't even start praying until you experience God's peace. Sit there for an hour if you need to. Just filtering all the junk of the day, all the fears, all the worries, all those things, kicking them out until God's peace comes over you. And then maybe you can really commune with him and really spend time with him. So what keeps me out? Anything of the world, anything of our flesh. Worldliness, a lot of worldliness. Worldliness is big, guys. Like in worldliness for me, um, it, might, it might seem kind of innocent, like worldliness, but like even sarcasm is worldliness, guys. Like I know it's like fun to be sarcastic. For me, I get convicted about sarcasm. Like you're not being genuine. You're not being authentic. You're just trying to hide your feelings and say something funny. Like sarcasm could be worldliness. You know, I've never remember being in God's presence and be led to be sarcastic, <laughs> you know? Like it's things like that, worldliness, these, these things that we just so easily allow into our lives that maybe are keeping us from God's presence. Maybe they're more real to us than God's presence is, right? That's the only, I don't know why that example came to my brain, but that's the only one I really have right now in my brain. So, um, but, but the things of the world, sin, obvious, big one, obvious. But the cool thing is God's presence is like radiation for sin. It's like radiation, what radiation does, the cancer cells, that's like what God's presence done, does the sin. Zaps it, takes the power out of it, er eradicates it from our life. It really does, it, it, it uproots that thing. It gives you conviction and grace to actually walk free of it. Right? It's, it's, it's awesome. Distractions keep you from God's presence. That's a big one. That's more worldliness. I'm so stuck in the world that I can't. If I, if I stop being connected to the world for five seconds, my world will fall apart. God won't be able to hold it together. So I need to always be connected to the world. And I can never get out of it and connect with God. Probably not true. Right? Um, yeah, that, that stuff keeps us out of it. And then my last question, number four, will be, what brings me in to God's presence? What brings me in to God's presence? I need a drink for this. I just want to be, I don't know that I have a perfect answer for this. Setting your heart on God, right? Like that would be my perfect, being aware of his presence and not striving to do it, but trusting him that he, he wants to come close, that he wants to draw near. I'm telling you, like, you have a big family event, What's the best thing ever you could do to make sure things don't go crazy and chaos and get together and just pray. Pray for one another. Just pray. Literally just pray. And all of a sudden I'm like, man, I love my cousin Earl and, and I love my, my uncle Jimmy Bob. And like I love these people so much because God loves them and I'm in his presence now. And all of a sudden, now the rest of the day, I'm like trying to be intentional with them. And I'm trying, all I did was pray. I didn't, I didn't do a 12-week course on how to have family reconciliation. I just prayed with them and got in the spirit. You know, this is a crazy thing. We only have unity with people in the spirit. We can only have unity with people in the spirit. I think sometimes it's like we have a whole, man, we have such a big church family, and it's so hard to keep gossip and slander and, and different things out. What do we do? We can't tame it unless we all get in the spirit together. And just get in God's presence together. The fact that we're in Christ together is what unifies us. Like, it's like, man, I can, I can try to, my wife and I can try to hash out every little thing I do that annoys her, everything that she does, that I, or we can just get in God's presence together and all of a sudden we have unity. So I encourage you, the people in your life, if you're going through something, you, don't, you can't see the way out, how can I be reconciled to this person? Pray together. Like, really pray together. Like, sit in God's presence together for a while. And all of a sudden you're going to love that person because God loves them. And your, your, your mind and soul and will and emotion is now being controlled by his love. It's better than like 50 ways to fix this.com, you know. How do I make sure bad things don't happen when I get together with people? Pray with them. <laughs> like that's why we pray. We, we get our hearts centered on God. We get in the spirit so that he can, we can be in his flow and not ours. It's so fun. I love, <laughs> I love it. It's good. Um. What brings me in, um, I will say this, we talked about oil last week, and like how, you know, God gave us this amazing engine called my inner man, called the new creation, the old has passed away, the new has come, but if it doesn't have oil, it will seize up, 
Right? So we talk about we need oil. We need God's presence, the Holy Spirit. We need to invite him. We want more and more of him. We want more and more of him. Um, but the thing about oil, which is neat, and I, I, think I, I think I said everything right first service. Nobody corrected me. But when you, you got, and like if it's a real cold morning, you're going to start the car and like maybe let it run for, you know, a couple minutes, 30 seconds at least. It's so the, the oil starts to heat up and, and be able to, to start running through, don't look at me, Dave, running through properly and doing this stuff that it's supposed to do. So it's really hard to just turn the car on and go 90. Like a lot of times we, what we try to do is like somebody's being mean to me right now. I haven't talked to God, looked at him, been in his presence for eight days. Holy Spirit, activate. And it's like, where's he at? Oh, my gosh. And then you just start hitting the person, right? So it's like, <laughs> it's, it's like the, the, we, we need to constantly have a flow of oil in our life. Constantly have a flow of oil. When I wake up in the morning, I need to be connecting with him. Literally, if your quiet time looks like this, you sit and you tell Jesus how much you love him until you forget about the world and you escape into a little piece of heaven and you pray about a couple things and you go to work. Five minutes, three minutes. It seems that the more consistent in my own life I am, the quicker that his peace comes over me. If it's been a while, it usually takes a little while. Press in. Because I think the biggest lie is you can't experience God's presence, and then you'll never press in through prayer. Then you'll never travail in prayer. Then you'll never press into him, and you'll just think, I'm supposed to live this way, always striving, always condemned, always feeling far from God. No, no, no. There's good news. You can, Jesus paved the way. You can, you can know his presence. You can, you can live with him. Right? You can really know him. And it's not just this random thing. It's about our hearts. It's about if we're looking at him or if we're not. Um, I love he says here in uh, chapter, in verse 17, it says, And, you know, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. It doesn't say suffer for him. It is for him. But it says suffer with him. Like he's there with you, and you know it because you have his presence. That's suffering with him. Suffering for the sake of suffering is like everybody in the entire world does that. Suffering with Christ for his glory, eyes fixed on him. That's the kind of suffering he's talking about. Not just like life sucks, I must be doing a great job as a Christian. Like that's, it's not just like that. It's, it's his suffering with him so we can be glorified with him. Right? And I think of a couple examples from the Bible Stephen, he was the first martyr um, of the New Testament, Acts chapter 7. It's so, like, literally, mm. anyways, uh, it's like he, he literally died for Jesus. Like, that's amazing. Like, that is amazing. He died, he gave his life drastically for Christ. You can't do that if you're not walking with him. You can't. You can't do that if you're not in the spirit. But here's, here's how Stephen's uh, thing went. He, he preached and everybody, they ran him out outside of the city gates and they stoned him to death. That's like, you ever play paintball? Airsoft? That, that hurts. They picked up giant stones and s- smashed him with them until his life left his body. Like, talk about excruciating. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 7 that Stephen, while they're stoning him, filled with the Holy Spirit, looks to heaven, sees the skies open, sees the Father, and or he doesn't see the Father actually, but he sees the Son sitting at the right hand of the Father. He was in glory, and he was being stoned to death. So something tells me we can have peace in our trials. Something tells me we can be in the Spirit on our worst day. If we look to heaven, right? Jesus on the cross. Literally battered and tattered beyond recognition of a human being. Then carries his cross around. Then they put the, 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 the thorns on him. I guess they did that before. but Then nailed to it. Then hung up on a tree. Then hang there asphyxiating for hours. Then say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He wasn't attached to this world. He wasn't setting his hope on like a decent tomorrow. He was in the spirit. I, bet he, he, I don't know. But he was in the spirit through the worst suffering, the worst thing. So I like, it's so, sometimes it's so hard to talk about suffering because my story doesn't look like everybody's story. Jesus' story is worse than all of ours on this earth. I promise. And he had perfect peace. So it's available to you. 
It's available to me. That's exciting. That gets me out of bed in the morning, gets me run into my prayer closet and excited to spend time with him. Duty and condemnation doesn't do that for me. It keeps me in bed. Um, there's this, this uh, two stories from the Old Testament I want to quickly share. And then, um, yeah, and then, and then we'll close. Um, first one, Moses. Moses was literally amazing. I keep saying literally, sorry. I'm being, Jesus said, truly, truly, I tell you a lot. So it's like my truly, I tell you. So whatever. <laughs> like, um, but, <laughs> silly. Um, Moses was awesome, right? He, we know him as like the greatest leader ever. How he met God was he encountered his presence in a burning bush. Hallelujah. He didn't go to Bible school. Bible school is good, but you know, you hear me. You, you understand what I'm saying. He encountered God's presence in a burning bush, right? And he, God spoke to him, said, you're going to do this. And he was like, oh my gosh, no way I can do that. Like, I'm terrible. He was totally in his flesh, right? Finally, he does the thing. He leads them out. Of, he leads like millions of people, of God's people, out of Egypt. They go through the wilderness. It was like the time of testing. It was 40 years in the wilderness, and it was grumbling. He was around the worst influences. So don't say, like, well, it's just because my family or my job, everybody's at whatever. Moses was around a million people complaining about him and God all the time. That's tough circumstances. He basically did not transgress God. He did not sin against God until the very end of his life in that season. The Bible doesn't reveal it, at least. I don't know if I can say that 100% certainty, but he's the only one who God calls faithful. You know that him and the million Israelites that were there, they all received God's law. They all knew the commandments. They all saw God's supernatural provision of bread every morning, of water, of, of honey. They all saw God move. They all heard of a promised land that they were striving towards. Yet there was one who was faithful. You know what the only thing different about Moses and the rest of the Israelites was? Moses spent time in God's presence. That's it. That's literally the only difference I can find. Maybe I'm wrong. The only difference from Moses and, and the million other Israelites who gave it their best go. So maybe we don't suck at this thing, guys. Maybe we're just doing it a little wrong. Maybe we're just valuing the wrong things. Maybe God didn't make a bunch of Christians that are just, he's just going to be so fed up with and like, Maybe there really is a way to live this thing out, you know? Maybe he's inviting us into it. Um, lastly, Elijah. This is kind of my last point. Uh, let me say this. Um, according, like, talking about God's presence, last week we, we talked about the Holy Spirit as oil. And does anybody know what anointing oil is? It's like oil that you anoint things with, Right? <laughs> Um, pretty solid, right? I know, I know. They, listen, I had a lot of years of college up here. No. Um, so what's really cool is to be anointed with oil makes you carry the fragrance of that oil. Like you walk around and you're not even like made of it, but you're smelling like it. Right? And so the Bible says that we Christian literally means little anointed one, anointed with the Holy Spirit. And so we literally walk around carrying the fragrance and aroma of Christ just because the Holy Spirit lives in us. That's super exciting. That's, that, that takes a lot of pressure off me. Like I just walk by and they'll smell him. No, it's, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's a him thing. It's not a me thing, right? So there's this really cool phrase that the Bible uses like in the early couple chapters of Luke. Um, and it, it's talking about Jesus as he was a boy and he was growing up, Right? And the Bible says that uh, in the King James Version, they use this peculiar phrase, he waxed strong in the spirit. In the original, ver or not the original, but like um, ESV or whatever, like another translation would say like he grew up and he grew strong in the spirit. But that one says waxed strong in the spirit. And I'm thinking like, okay, wha what does that mean? Waxed means like to get bigger, like the moon, I think. Like it's, it gets bigger until something else happens and something else happens. Um, very, a lot of knowledge. Um, but then I'm like, you know, what, what else is going on? So there's this thing that you can do with wax, which is really cool. You take something that you want to be protected, and you actually melt the wax over it. And it will actually go all the way down over it and cover it completely, and then you let it sit, and it dries and hardens. And now all of a sudden, that thing that's really precious, not strong at all, very delicate, 
it's now covered with a protective layer of wax. What, if you would want to make it more strong, you would, after it cools and dries, you would put another covering over it of, of the wax. And then you would put another covering of the wax. And then you would put another cover. All of a sudden, it almost has more wax than it does. There's almost more wax there than there is the original thing. So I want to present to you that as we spend time, the Bible says, as we behold his glory, we're transformed from one degree of glory to the next. As we're in his presence, not nailing a Bible study in the Bible app. That could be part of your time in his presence, but not just that. As we're connecting to him, looking at him, experiencing him. The Bible says we're transformed. I, I, I submit to you that you're being covered with a, a layer of wax. And that layer is going to harden. And maybe five minutes after you get out of the prayer closet, maybe you're trying this for the new thing, five minutes after, like, your kids are completely haywire, and you freak out on them. Well, that's because the layer is still thin. <laughs> maybe it didn't fully dry yet, right? And, and your flesh broke right out of that spirit cage, right? <laughs> but what if after, like, months, weeks and months and years of you sowing, 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 sowing into the spirit, at due time you reap a harvest, of being so covered by Christ. And now it takes a lot more than just your kids running wild to get you out of the Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit becomes more real to you than the world around you. Now all of a sudden we're like covered and protected and coated with Him. And we smell like Him. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. The Bible literally says we are the aroma, the fragrance of Christ. So my last thing I want to say Oh, and, and when, you, when you have all that on you, you're, you have that much of the presence of God you're going into battle with. That much of the presence of God you're going into your workplace with. That much of the presence of God you're going into, and, and it's a wonderful thing because his presence and not my presence is good, really good. Um, last thing I'll say, there's an example in, in uh, Elijah. He's awesome. It's in 1 Kings 17 through something, um, and... He lives this awesome life. God supernaturally feeds him everywhere he goes. He's like, go to the brook, and I'll take care of you there. And ravens literally bring him food. And go here, and I'll have this widow feed you here. Like, God was all about providing for this man, building his faith and providing for him, feeding him. It's awesome. All of a sudden, Elijah wins this big battle. He calls down fire. You know, he shows that God's better than Baal. And woohoo, everybody goes crazy. But Jezebel says, I want that guy's life. Sends out all these people to go kill him, to chase him down and kill him. Probably worse than your circumstance. <laughs> Definitely worse than my circumstance. This is big stuff. Like, Many people are coming to kill you. If you're seen, you're dead. That's crazy. I don't know what that's like. So Elijah runs, and he hides in a cave. Right? He actually runs, and God feeds him, and then he runs again and hides in a cave. <laughs> and God actually feeds him in the cave. Pretty crazy. He'll feed you in a cave, right? I don't know if that's good. But, um, but all of a sudden, God says to Elijah in the cave, why are you here? What are you doing here? And Elijah was totally in his flesh. He was like, well, God, I've been faithfully following you, and nobody else around will. They're all trying to kill me, right? And, and all the prophets forsook you. That's why I'm in the cave. Is that a good enough reason for you, God? Like, he just totally lost sight of all of God's reality. He just literally gave God glory to hundreds of thousands of people in front of the prophets of Baal. Totally lost sight of that. Who cares about that, God? My circumstance stinks, and I'm the only one faithful. And God's like, first of all, he tells him later on, actually, like, Elijah was totally wrong. He said, I still have 7,000 faithful people in Israel. You just couldn't see him because you weren't in the spirit. You couldn't see him because you were in your flesh. You had a glaze over your eyes that said, everything is bad for me. And God said this, though. He, he said this thing. It's, it's so cool because God sends his word into the cave, but his presence didn't go into the cave. Elijah was in there in his own funk, in his grudge, his unforgiveness, his bitterness, his comparisons. Even just maybe stuck in his own mind, he can't stop thinking about all these things. God sends his word, but not his presence. And he said, Elijah, I want you to come out of that cave and stand before my presence. And Elijah didn't move. He didn't follow. And so God, the whirlwind comes, we know, the, the, the fire comes, the whatever, whatever comes, it's all crazy. And then he hears God's voice outside the cave in a still small voice. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times we're like, wow, look at this awesome thing. I believe that this was actually the sign. I, the next thing that God said after this scenario to Elijah was, your mantle's done, go anoint somebody else to do what you're doing. Yeah, you're going to go to heaven. It's going to be marvelous. You're going to spend eternity with me. But your mission, the assignment I have for you in this world, it's done. Go anoint Elisha and a couple others. 
And I believe the reason he said that to him is because Elijah didn't leave his bunk, his cave, to stand in the presence of God. He went to the very entrance of the cave. He wrapped his head with like, so he couldn't actually see. He wrapped it. It was like a shame thing. It's, and, and he didn't obey God. And the presence came, but he didn't bask in the glory of God. Literally, the word that was spoken to him was, your mission's done. Go anoint somebody else. I want to encourage us. God's presence will do all the things the word says, but we got to leave our cave to get in it. We got to leave her. I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation, but there's a whole lot of abundant life in God's presence that He wants you to experience here. There's a whole lot of fruit in your family. There's a whole lot of reconciliation. There's a whole lot of ministry. There's a whole lot of understanding and revelation in God's Word He wants to give you, but you got to leave your cave and you got to value His presence. It's not like anything in this world, it's not something you work at, it's something you receive. It's something you sacrifice for. Maybe you fast. Fasting is literally, I'm going to say no to my flesh. And I'm going to press into God to experience his presence more. Like, it's good. If you knew that God's presence is going to be way stronger in your life when you fasted, you'd probably fast more. Like, it's okay to have a reward for these things. The reward is him. He's, he's worthy. So I want to just call us today as the worship team comes out and, and plays. Uh, you don't have to start playing until I'm done. But uh, I want to challenge us today. Someone in here, somebody, some people, a couple of us, maybe all of us, we got to leave our cave we got to leave our cave and get in God's presence. Uh, I want to invite you during this song, if you'd like to, because this is like, this is about you and, and God. If, 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 I, if, if a pastor or a leader was your answer, they'd have to follow you around your whole life and tell you what's good and what's bad. But what if we could get, connect you, what if we could get you connected to the head? The, the Holy One, the one who will teach you all things. What if you could connect with him and then he, Jesus, could teach you all things and walk with you and go with you where you go? If we could do that, we might see some Christians really getting transformed. We might see some things really happening. So I want to encourage you between you and God today, if you'd like to come up during this song, it's a wonderful song, and, and kneel here, anywhere, there's lots of room, and come to the altar <laughs> and kneel, and, and I, I promise you God will meet you here. Like if he's putting it on your heart to come up, like it's going to be such a, you're going to get up here and tears are going to flow, and, and you're going to feel God's love and his presence, and it's just saying, God, I want to surrender. I want to value your presence. I want to sit in your presence and start right now, this moment. Not think about what's next today, lunch, whatever. I encourage you during this song, as God moves, you can come up now. You can come up as the song kind of starts. And, and during COVID, everybody was afraid for their lives and wasn't sure what was going on. And church was so free. We just came up all the time. And we're like, it was right when I got saved. I was like, this is so cool. This is church. Woo. Like, it was awesome. People just coming up, confessing their sins, praying over each other, coming up, kneeling down. It was so cool. And then all of a sudden, we got back to normal. And we... Stop pursuing God that way. Stop being free to worship. I want to encourage you to just break that mold. Um, come up.